Okay, what is up there YouTube, this is a J-Man Time, and today I have a video on some of Germany's first generation of medium tanks, and these were rare experimental tanks that were developed during the era of the Weimar Republic, and these were the Graus tractors, or large tractors, and they were a series of experimental medium tanks, some of them amphibious tanks, that were developed between 1926 in 1930. Now, after World War I, Germany was forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles, and the Treaty of Versailles stated that Germany could not develop any tanks in the post-war era. As a result, during the early interwar years between 1919 and 1925, the Germans mostly developed armored cars and self-propelled guns, as those were the only things they weren't banned from when it came to armored fighting vehicles. That all changed in 1926. In 1926, the Weimar Republic launched a secret program known as Army Wagon 20. Army Wagon 20 was the callout for the development of a secret medium tank project that would be developed by Germany's surviving arms manufacturers. Now, after World War I, many of Germany's World War I era arms manufacturers and vehicle manufacturers went out of business, but there were still three companies that could produce armored fighting vehicles. And those companies were Krupp, Rheinmetall Borsig, and Daimler Benz. And these companies were contracted by the German military to develop Germany's first generation of post-World War I era medium and heavy tanks. Six tanks were developed between 1927 and 1930. Two tanks were developed by each company, two developed by Krupp, two developed by Rheinmetall Borsig, and two developed by Daimler Benz. All six tanks had a twin turreted system, which included a main turret with one main gun and a secondary gun, usually a machine gun, and one rear turret mounting a machine gun. The main armament was a 175mm KWK L24 main gun for all six tanks, while the secondary armament of the first four tanks were one 7.92mm machine gun and the same main turret, while the rear turret was armed with a machine gun. Ryan Metal Borsig did design one of their tanks to house both a 75mm gun and a 37mm gun. This was one of the final two tanks developed. The armor thickness of the tanks varied between the each manufacturer. The armor thickness of the first two tanks was 6 to 13 millimeters. The second batch of tanks had an armor thickness of 6 to 14 millimeters. And the final batch had an armor thickness of 6 to 19 millimeters. The speed of all tanks was 43.4 kilometers per hour, or 27 miles per hour, almost 28 miles per hour on one tank. Each tank had a crew of six. These tanks also had some other design differences, mostly when it came to weight and wheels. Keep in mind that these tanks were developed as wheeled track tanks. These were tanks that could run without tracks. They could use their wheels, their road wheels, on flat terrain, on flat open terrain, but could also use tracks on hilly and rough terrain. The tracks could be removed or replaced at any time. It came to weight. The weight of these tanks were different depending on the manufacturer. The Daimler Benz tanks weighed 19 tons and were the heaviest, while the Krupp tanks weighed just 16 tons, and the Rheinmetall Borsig tanks weighed 15 tons and were the lightest. The Rheinmetall Borsig tanks were also designed as amphibious medium tanks and had the ability to float as their hulls were completely sealed turning them into Germany's first generation of post-World War I amphibious tanks. They also had a different number of road wheels. The Daimler-Benz tanks had 16 road wheels, while the Krupp tanks had 14 road wheels. Another huge difference came when it came to the escape hatch, as Rheinmetall Borsig was the only manufacturer to include an escape hatch on their two tanks. The other two tanks did not have escape hatches, and escape hatches were seen as very important when it came to tank development in the late 1920s and early 1930s, as you needed an escape hatch in case the main hatch or main entryway was blocked or damaged in combat. 
Another difference when it came to the Rhine Mental Tanks is the final two Rhine Mental Tanks had a completely different layout than the four Daimler Benz and Krupp tanks. One Rhine Metal Borsig tank had a long barreled 75mm gun, while the second Rhine Metal Borsig tank had a mixed armament of one 75mm KWK L24 man gun and a 37mm KWK 36 45mm gun in the same turret. So this was a twin turreted tank on the second to last Rhine Metal Borsig amphibious medium tank. Now, the tanks were actually tested in Russia. During this time period, Germany and the Soviet Union had a military cooperation agreement. And this agreement stated that both the Weimar Republic and the Soviet Union would trade military secrets with one another, and they would also trade technology. Since the Weimar Republic was not allowed to develop tanks openly, they would secretly test their tanks and armored fighting vehicles and even some of their experimental planes in the Soviet Union. And between 1929 and 1933, the Grouse tractors were tested at the Kamov tank testing facility located in Kazan, Russia, or the Soviet Union. Between 1929 and 1933, these tanks were tested rigorously um, in order to see which one of these six prototype tanks would become Germany's standard medium tank. During the test, however, most of the tanks did pretty mediocre with the exception of the Rheinmetall Borsig tanks. For starters, the Daimler Benz tanks had problems with their transmission, similar to what the German Tiger tank would have in World War II. The Daimler Benz tanks would constantly break down or their transmissions would give out. As a result, the Daimler Benz tanks were only able to drive a mere 66 kilometers before they were ultimately kicked out of the test due to too many mechanical issues. The Krupp tanks also had similar problems. The Krupp company was able to keep them into competition. The Rhein Metal Borsig tanks completed most of their terrain tests, but they failed the amphibious test, as the Rhein Metal Borsig tanks were the only ones designed with amphibious capabilities. They were the only ones tested to be used as amphibious medium tanks. And during the test, one of the Rheinmetall Borsig tanks actually actually capsized in shallow water, killing one of the German tankers involved in the test. As a result, Rheinmetall Borsig would not develop any more amphibious tanks after the Rheinmetall Borsig Grouse Tractor experiments. But the Rheinmetall Borsig tanks, along with the Krupp tanks, were continuously tested until 1933. In 1933, the National Socialists took over Germany, and as a result, Germany and the Soviet Union no longer saw each other as allies, or as equals on that matter. In 1933, the tanks were recalled, as by this point, all of the cooperation agreements signed between Germany and the Soviet Union were now null and void, and the Soviet Union and Germany would continue to be rivals at least up until 1938. In 1938, Germany and the Soviet Union would sign the Molotov Ribbon Pact, and this was an agreement between Germany and the Soviet Union to at least be economic trade partners. Between 1933 and 1937, however, the Grouse tractors were used as training tanks, and in some cases they were used as the first tanks to arm the German Panzer divisions. Germany's first Three Panzer Divisions, the 1st, 3rd, and 5th Panzer Divisions, had one Grouse Tractor each, and they were used as training tanks mostly, until four of the Grouse Tractors were decommissioned in 1937. At least one or two Grouse Tractors continued to be used as training tanks during the early part of World War II, or at least it seems so, as there are some photographs of the Grouse Tractor being used as a training tank in World War II, just like the other experimental German tank from the interwar era, the Lisch Tractor. The Lisch Tractor being an experimental series of light tanks, just like the Grouse Tractor. Now, during World War II, the Grouse Tractors were decommissioned again and were used as target practice for the German Panzerfaust and Panzerstreck teams of the German Wehrmacht and later the German Volkssturm or Peoplesturm, which were the 
the last ditch militias put together by the Germans at the end of World War II. There are some photographs of the Grouch tractors being used as target practice between 1944 and 1945. It is unknown if all of the Grouch tractors were destroyed in this way. It is assumed that at least one or two Grouch tractors might have been reactivated as tanks for either the German army or the Volkssturm at the very end of the war when both the Soviet Union and the United States were invading Germany between 1944 and 1945. At this point of the war, the Germans were pretty much using whatever tanks and armored cars they had left, and I assume the Grosch tractor might have been one of those vehicles. Either way, all of the Grosch tractors were pretty much destroyed during the Second World War. Now, the real question is, how good would the Grouse Tractor be in World War II if it had been developed enough to serve in World War II as a frontline German tank? Well, the first two tanks, or the first two series of Grouse Tractor experimental tanks from Daimler, Benz, and Krupp were pretty garbage, I would say. They had too many mechanical issues and were ultimately ultimately only used as training vehicles. Now, the Rheinmetall Borsig tanks had... I guess the greatest use as a frontline tank. One, they were amphibious tanks, and the amphibious design could have been worked on during the later interwar years. And these vehicles also could have served at least as export tanks for Germany's Axis allies, similarly to what the British did with their Vickers medium and light tanks and light export tanks that were sold to countries like Greece, China, and even Poland and the Soviet Union, and Latin America during the interwar years. If the Germans had continued manufacturing the Grouse tractors, the Rheinmetall version of the Grouse tractor, they could have manufactured it as an export tank at least to most of their Axis allies like Romania and Hungary and even their puppet states like the independent state of Croatia as all of those factions lacked tanks when compared to Germany, Italy, and Japan. The Italians could also use some of these tanks as, even though the Grouse tractor was considered outdated by World War II, it was still more advanced than most of the Italian tanks used during the Second World War. And that 75mm long-barreled version of the Rheinmetall Borsig tank would have been useful on the battlefields in North Africa. North Africa probably would have been the best battlefield for the Grouse tractor as it was largely open terrain, and the Grouse tractor's main advantage was its speed. It had a speed of 27 miles per hour, so it was faster than most, if not all, of the medium tanks that were already in service at the start of World War II. The only weakness of the Grouse tractor was really its armor thickness. It only had an armor thickness of 6 to 19 millimeters, or 6 to 14 millimeters, depending on source, meaning it was pretty vulnerable to most 37 millimeter fire and above. So most of the British and Soviet and American anti-tank guns would have been an overkill for the Grouse tractors. So if the Grouse tractor had been manufactured, I would assume the Germans would have to increase that armor thickness, just like they did with the Panzer III and IV. Remember, the Panzer III and IV had very thin armor also, only 20 to 30 millimeters at the start, but that was later increased to 50 to 75 millimeters on some later war production models. The Germans could have done the same thing with the Rheinmetall Borsig Grouse tractors. They could have increased the armor thickness and fuel capacity, and these vehicles would have been mostly useful on the flat terrain on the battlefields of places like North Africa, and even on some of the battlefields on the Eastern Front against the Soviet Union. And like I said, they would have been useful as export tanks to Germany's Axis allies like Romania, Hungary, and maybe even Italy and neutral countries like Finland could have used these tanks too, especially the long-barreled version produced by Rheinmetall. So what do you all think of the Grouse Tractors, Germany's first series of medium tanks after World War I? And please tell me in the comment section below. And until next time, this was J-Man Time, signing off.